Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we will continue to see some basic properties of root system. Uh, in particularly, we will try to classify uh, the rank 1 and rank 2 root systems. So, before that, uh, let me first introduce uh, what is called this isomorphism of root systems. So, let us uh, first recall the definition of uh, root systems. Okay. So, a finite set phi of E is said to be a root system if it satisfies the following condition. The very first condition is 0 is not in phi and span of phi must be equal to E. The second condition if alpha is in phi and C alpha is in phi then we should get if and only if C equal to plus or minus 1. The third condition if alpha is in phi, so then if you apply S alpha phi then you should get back phi. The fourth condition if alpha beta is in phi, so then if you look at this kata number angle beta comma alpha which is 2 beta alpha divided by alpha alpha, so this should be inside phi. So, these are all the properties of uh, root system. So, now we say actually two root systems they are isomorphic. So, naturally uh, we have to preserve the properties 1 to 4. So, that means we need to have uh, an isomorphism between uh, these uh, Euclidean spaces. So, let us call this phi comma e and phi comma phi dash comma e dash. So, this is these are all two given uh, root system and then we say uh, this is isomorphic if there exists an isomorphism from E to E dash. So, not necessarily isometry it is just an isomorphism. So, that even it is invertible linear transformation. So, this sense this capital phi onto phi dash capital phi onto phi dash such that so these kata numbers when you apply phi then it should be preserved so the kata number phi of beta comma phi of alpha so this should be equal to so beta comma alpha for each pair of roots alpha beta inside phi. If your uh, if there exists such an isomorphism from your Euclidean space E to E dash that maps being phi to phi dash that preserving these kata numbers then we say that these root systems they are all isomorphic. So, let us see some consequences of this isomorphism. So, it is immediate that once we have this uh, kata numbers preserving then let us calculate uh, what happens if you apply pi on S alpha of beta. So, you take pi and then apply it on S alpha beta. So, then you can see that this is going to be pi of beta minus the angle beta comma alpha alpha. So, that means this is going to be pi of beta minus the angle beta comma alpha pi of alpha. But since this angle beta comma alpha the kata number associated with the beta alpha is same as the kata number associated with the pi of beta and pi of alpha. So, that forces that this pi of S alpha of beta is equal to pi of beta minus the angle pi of beta comma pi of alpha times pi of alpha which is S of pi of alpha of pi of beta. So, this indeed tells us that pi composition with S alpha is same as S pi of alpha composition with pi. So, that means this pi commits with this S alpha. So, when you take this conjugate S alpha pi inverse, so then you get S of pi alpha. So, that is how it commits. Okay. So, now this equation allows us to define natural isomorphism between the corresponding while groups. So, let us denote this w of pi to be the while group uh, 
corresponding to pi and w of pi dash to be the while group corresponding to pi dash. So, then recall that w of pi defined to be a subgroup of G L of E generated by this reflection S alpha uh, where alpha comes from this phi. So, this is inside G L of E. So, now what we can do using this pi one can define this pi tilde which is a map from w of pi to this w of pi dash. So, this is given to be where you send sigma to just the conjugate of sigma under pi, pi sigma pi inverse. Now, using this formula pi uh, sig s alpha pi inverse is same as s pi alpha, you can see that uh, this pi tilde map. So, that is indeed a, indeed an isomorphism. So, check that pi tilde is pi tilde is an isomorphism of groups. Okay. So, that way this w of while groups corresponding to phi phi dash, so they are actually naturally isomorphic. So, now what we want to do? We want to understand uh, what will be the automorphism of phi. Okay. So, automorphism of phi will be again uh, it is just an isomorphism of E to E. So, that is uh, invertible in your transformations from E to E that satisfy these conditions. But uh, using our uh, lemma 1 that I proved in the last class, uh, we can see that uh, so this uh, condition can be relaxed. Okay. So, let me just uh, uh, write down the result uh, then it will become clear. So, what I mean by uh, the condition can be relaxed. Okay. So, here is this lemma 2, so which is uh, can be used to understand automorphism of phi. So, here is lemma 2 in this chapter. So, what is the lemma 2 says? So, you start with phi being a root system, let be phi be a root system inside your Euclidean space capital E and then the while group of uh, this uh, phi is denoted by w. So, if we take some sigma which is coming from G L of E, so that leaves phi invariant okay, sigma of phi equal to phi. So, then we can immediately conclude that if we take conjugate of this S alpha with sigma then we get S sigma of alpha. So, if sigma of phi equal to phi, so then one can immediately conclude that sigma S alpha sigma inverse must be same as S sigma alpha for all alpha in phi. So, in particularly if we compute this kata number beta comma alpha, so that will be equal to sigma of beta comma sigma of alpha for all alpha beta inside phi. So, this is the conclusion of uh, this lemma 2. So, now let us see uh, what is the immediate corollary of this lemma 2. So, in order to check the isomorphism between uh, uh, phi and phi, so that means automorphism of phi. So, we need to check that, uh, so this there will be a pi from this E to E that satisfying these conditions. Okay. But the thing is if pi if it is actually is an invertible linear transformation from E to E that sends uh, phi to phi. So, then using this lemma we lemma 2 we conclude that this kata numbers they are already preserved. So, that means we do not need to check this condition this extra condition that we have here. So, this this extra condition. So, in indeed this lemma actually allows us to uh, conclude that as an immediately corollary if sigma is in G L of E, okay, sigma is an automorphism of phi if and only if sigma just leaves phi invariant. Okay. So, by definition if sigma is automorphism of phi then sigma must leave phi invariant and uh, we are saying that is also enough if sigma leaves phi invariant then using this lemma 2 we conclude that the kata numbers are preserved 
and this conjugation so sigma s alpha sigma inverse must be equal to s sigma of alpha. So, this is uh, somewhat immediate corollary of actually lemma 2 which is again lemma 2 can be obtained from uh, the lemma 1 which I recall from uh, the previous class. So, what is lemma 1 says if you take a fine phi being a finite set that spans capital E and all the reflections that that comes from this uh, elements of phi that leaves phi invariant. So, then uh, you have let us say sigma in G L of V uh, that leaves again phi invariant that fixes point wise a hyperplane capital P of V and sends some non-zero alpha in phi to its negative then the sigma must be S alpha. So, that is what we have seen. Okay. So, we will use this result to prove that uh, our lemma 2 which is useful in understanding the automorphism of phi. Okay. So, let us start with sigma that leaves phi invariant. So, we need to conclude that sigma s alpha sigma inverse must be s sigma alpha. So, let us compute what is this sigma s alpha sigma inverse. So, here is the proof. So, let us compute this uh, you fix this sigma inside your G L of E such that the sigma actually just leaves phi invariant. So, now compute sigma s alpha sigma inverse how it acts. So, note that if you just compute this on sigma of beta for any beta we get it is exactly equal to sigma s alpha of beta. So, if beta comes from this phi then it is immediate that uh, this sigma s alpha sigma inverse of this uh, sigma of beta that will lie again inside phi. It is in phi if alpha beta is in phi. So, this is immediate. So, now just recall what it is uh, to say that sigma s alpha act on beta. So, then using the formula of s alpha you can see that this is going to be exactly sigma of beta minus twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha times alpha. So, which is going to be equal to sigma of beta minus twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha times sigma of alpha. So, this is what the formula says. So, now if we take uh, some element that is in sigma of p alpha. So, then you can see that this sigma s alpha sig inverse must fix that element. Okay. So, let some x is in sigma of p alpha. So, that means x can be written as sigma of y for some y in p alpha. So, now let us compute what happens sigma s alpha sigma inverse of this x. So, then you can see that this is going to be sigma s alpha sigma inverse x will be y, but y is coming from p alpha. So, s alpha fixes y. So, then we get this is sigma of y. So, which is going to be x. So, that means sigma s alpha sigma inverse fixes all the elements of this sigma of p alpha. So, note that sigma of p alpha is going to be another hyperplane. So, this is going to be some hyperplane and we already seen that sigma s alpha sigma inverse indeed leaves this phi invariant because if when beta varies over phi then sigma of beta will vary over phi again. So, that tells us that so this is the first condition this is the second condition sigma s alpha sigma inverse of phi is nothing but phi. Okay. So, so that means so some of the hypothesis that are there in lemma 1 they are that are satisfied. So, this sigma s alpha sigma inverse actually fixes a hyperplane and it leaves phi invariant. So, all we need to check it actually kind of uh, take some uh, non-zero element of phi to its negative. So, let us do this simple calculation and then see that a sigma s alpha sigma inverse uh, 
uh, when you act it on sigma of alpha. So, then what you get is exactly equal to sigma s alpha of alpha which is going to be minus sigma alpha. So, note that sigma of alpha is coming from phi and it is non-zero because all the elements of phi are non-zero. So, this proves that sigma s alpha sigma inverse satisfies all the hypotheses that are there in lemma 1. So, let us go back to lemma 1 and then check all the hypothesis. So, you can see that so whatever hypothesis that are there for this sigma is satisfied by sigma x alpha sigma inverse. Sigma phi is phi and it fixes point wise hyperplane and it sends some non-zero vector alpha to its negative. So, all these hypotheses are satisfied for sigma s alpha sigma inverse. So, in particularly we can conclude that the sigma s alpha sigma inverse must be a reflection with respect to this vector sigma alpha. So, that means from this using lemma 1 we conclude that sigma s inverse s alpha sigma inverse is nothing but s of sigma of alpha. So, that is what we got. So, now using this formula we can see that uh, already we did some computation. So, what is s of sigma of alpha of beta? So, you can see that s of sigma of alpha sigma beta is going to be sigma beta minus twice sigma beta comma sigma of alpha divided by sigma of alpha comma sigma of alpha times sigma of alpha. So, that means if you compute sigma s alpha sigma inverse of sigma of beta. So, then we have seen that this is exactly equal to sigma s alpha of beta. So, which is given by sigma of beta minus twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha times sigma of alpha. So, these two things must be equal and since this is equal for all beta. So, from that you can conclude that for beta in phi. So, you get this twice the sigma beta <coughs> and sigma of alpha divided by sigma of alpha comma sigma of alpha must be equal to twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha. So, that means the Carta numbers corresponds to beta alpha and sigma beta sigma alpha they are all same. So, from this uh, we conclude that uh, to check something is on automorphism of phi it is enough to check uh, <coughs> it leaves phi invariant. So, now in particularly as an immediate corollary <coughs> we can conclude that uh, any elements of this wild group w that will act as automorphism of phi. So, because if we take some sigma in w, so then naturally w is sitting inside g l of e and note that this sigma also leaves phi invariant. So, that makes it sigma is actually defines automorphism of phi using lemma 2. So, this way you can identify w inside this automorphism of phi. Okay. So, this is a very important uh, observation. So, later we will see that there are some other art natural automorphisms uh, that are sitting inside uh, automorphism of phi. Okay. So, that will come from what is called this uh, uh, Dinkin diagram automorphisms. So, anyway uh, that requires some more work. So, we will actually uh, do that later. So, now uh, I will define uh, some more uh, important notions uh, related to root systems. Okay, after that, uh, I will stop. So, so given a root system, so let's say phi e. So this is a given root system. So given this root system, one can naturally define what is called dual root system. So, what is dual root system? So, for that let us first define what is called dual roots. So, in a way this is actually corresponds to uh, between T alpha and H alpha or alpha and H alpha. So, this is the kind of uh, correspondence that we are trying to imitate here. 
So, if you think about it what is h alpha? h alpha is given by 2 uh, times t alpha divided by alpha alpha. So, alpha corresponds to t alpha using that uh, like natural that uh, killing form identification of h and h star. So, then this uh, t alpha and h alpha they are like related by this scaling. Okay. So, this is what we want to imitate. So, if we imitate this then we get what is called dual root system. So, for that purpose let us define this alpha check by 2 alpha divided by alpha alpha using the inner product one can work inside E itself. So, there is no harm. So, then these elements will be non-zero definitely. So, then we can form this what is called pi check. So, you take E check to be capital E itself no problem and then you define this pi check to be. So, those of this alpha collect all this alpha check where alpha coming from phi and this will be called what is called dual root system. So, dual root system of this phi. So, it is actually elementary to check. So, I will leave it to you to check that this phi check is indeed a root system. Okay. So, you have to check all the properties of root system. For example, 0 is not there and the only multiples are plus or minus uh, alpha check and then if you take uh, uh, this uh, kata numbers they must be integers, but that is again like if you calculate the kata number you can see that they have real close relationship with the kata numbers of original root system. And again reflections, uh, so, so it is easy to see S yes alpha check must be equal to S yes alpha. In particularly one can diff one can naturally identify the while group of phi check with phi. Okay. Using this we can identify uh, phi with uh, phi check. Okay. So, we will use this uh, natural identifications under later. Again, so this dual root system will play a crucial role in the classification. Uh, so, again uh, some, of, some of the properties are actually easy to see once you go to the real, dual root system and come back. So, whatever you know in linear algebra for example, how the dual spaces are actually used the same way uh, in some sense dual root system also will be used. Okay. We can get uh, many information about the original root system using the dual root system. Okay. So, I am running out of time now I guess uh, I will stop here. And then I will continue in the next class uh, with the smaller dimensional uh, root systems and their classifications. Thank you.